I think they're passing it around. You know who's got the, who's got the file? No, he's looking for the the sign in. Tony, Tim's got it. It's behind you. No, no, behind you, Tim. Behind you, Tony. Shockingly, no. Except my water heat, my water heater happened to be leaking all over my floor during all that time. Yeah, but it had nothing to do with the weather. But it didn't bust, so it just was a slow leak. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. All right, well, I think we might be at capacity. We're at 45. So we'll, we'll go ahead and begin. Well, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, you have taught us by your word that you are true God. Help us to understand how you have revealed it to us and put it into the scriptures so that we would have a sure and certain testimony of what you have said. Help us trust in this and help us learn daily how you have provided for us in these scriptures. Amen. All right. Well, we're sort of going to cover a, a lot. I, th this is going to be like a survey. Um, you'll notice the uh, it's a summary from Franz Pieper. So Franz Pieper uh, is probably in our, in our day. He was in like the 40s, 50s. And he wrote this dogmatics textbook that was and still is used today at the seminary. Uh, at first he wrote it in German. And in the past, if you're going to seminary, you had to learn German. And they instructed in German. Uh, up until, gosh, do you know Pastor Wolf? I can't remember when they stopped instructing in German in the, at the seminary. It was pretty late. Yeah, World War II was... Yeah, right. Yeah, World War II was a good, a good catalyst. German wasn't considered good anymore. Um, so... So, this, so Pieper wrote this, and he was really, a, I mean, he was a genius. He condensed all these sources together from everything at the time, as well as all, you know, going back in history of the Lutheran dogmaticians. So I'm going to say the word dogmatic. You might have heard that word as something derogatory, um, but uh, dogma is nothing more than the teachings of our church condensed into categories for easy understanding. So, so he wrote a dogmatics textbook systematically laying out everything that was in the scriptures. Um, so this is his explanation of the holy scriptures. Uh, I wanted to give you that only because if you'd like to go deep, you can, you can buy this dogmatics book yourself. There, it's three volumes, but this is volume one. Um, and this is just a tiny section. So... Uh, but Pieper was dealing with uh, what was happening at the seminary. <clears throat> well, I guess he was sort of before that time. But even in, in his day, uh, the authority of Scripture was being challenged. Now, uh, does any, has anyone heard of Simonex? You know what Simonex is? Well, yeah, you know. So Simonex uh, happened in our synod. Um, and it, was it the 70s? Pastor 1974. So uh, this was a buildup over time of what had been going on. We have two seminaries, St. Louis and Fort Wayne. 
So what had been going on in St. Louis Seminary is they had been uh, imbibing of the philosophy of the time, and it was called textual criticism. And basically what they were doing is uh, eliminating the foundation of Scripture. Uh, because what they would say is, well, you know, we can't be certain about anything that's in there. Because, first of all, people wrote it, and people are unreliable, and therefore uh, we can't fully see what God is saying. So, so here was the key phrase during that time. The scriptures contain the word of God. Is that right or wrong? I would say yes. Okay. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, it, 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 they do. But, but here's the thing. They, they used it to say, but the scriptures are not identical with the word of God, as in every word. Now, that could be as small as this. Well, that word, God didn't speak. Therefore, you can't say it's identical with God's word. So it only contains it. Now, if you have doubt about one of the words in there, why wouldn't you have doubt about the rest? And this is sort of how they chipped away at the authority of Scripture. Um, so this is, this is Peeper. He was dealing with all these things in his time uh, and having to respond to them. Uh, so his section on Scripture is actually like 80 pages long. And it's, you know, it, no, is it 80? No, it's 160 pages long. Uh, and uh, so, so I'm not going to give you all 160 pages. I distilled 60 pages. So this is 60 page condensation. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to split this up into three little groupings, and this is sort of the uh, the intro, and then the next will be next. Yes, Gary. Briefly, uh, you, you should know that the ELCA, which is made up of the former ALC American Lutheran Church, Lutheran Church in America, and also Seminex. Uh, holds that uh, that very premise as doctrine for them that uh, it contains the word of God and it isn't the word of God in our space. Right. So we attended briefly at the Nail Church one time. I heard that same raised me very soon. I said, "Well, we're out of here." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you hear that again, it's not. It's it, this is the thing with deception, right? It, it just starts with some truth and then mix in a little bit of a lie. But any lie that's mixed with the truth, what, what happens to the truth? It's all it becomes a lie, right? The whole thing becomes a lie. Um, all right. So, uh, so we're going to delve into this. Um, feel free to pop your hand up with questions anytime. Uh, I'm more of a question and answer anyway. So, um, so that's my, my style. Okay. So Holy Scripture... It's teachings and applications from Scripture itself. Um, so I, I just want to tell you about the layout of this. I put sort of the theses here of like the main point and then underneath that. So I tried to make it as visually understandable as possible. So the boldened black is the bigger theses and everything underneath it shows it. So uh, if you wanted a, a short summary, you could, you could, we could finish this in five words, five, five sentences. Okay. So scripture is the only source and norm of belief in life. Number two, scripture is identical with the word of God. Number three, the scriptures are the word of God because they're inspired, that is, given by the Holy Spirit. Four, the Holy Ghost speaks by, through the prophets. So the words they speak, write, are not, their, are not theirs, but God's. So the writers are named clerks, secretaries, hands, pens of the Spirit. Thus the apostles and prophets were instruments. And five, the objections to the doctrine of inspiration listed below are a sad description of the many reasons used to deny the foundations of the church, namely the scriptures, that is, the word of God. Some erroneously reject the doctrine of inspiration because, and those are listed below. All right, so at the source of it, we base everything on these scriptures because the only way to have knowledge of God 
is how? Right? Why? Why is that the only way to know about God? It's what? It's the only constant. Anything else? It's the only constant. Okay, true. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so so it's the only thing that's going to stay the same. Yeah. What? How? Why is it that... Yeah. Right, right. Um, maybe you've experienced the very annoying... Um, situation where someone assumes what you're thinking. I'm sure that's never happened. You husbands and wives, you should know that. <laughs> How could you assume that I was thinking that, right? Because what is the only way to know what someone is thinking? <laughs> to, to be them or to, to ask them, right? They have to tell you what they're thinking. This is the unique thing about thought. is It is... It is you can't see it, and the only way to know it is for it to be spoken. So we have an experience of what it's like to not have any access to something unless we're given access. Right? Um, this happens in other ways too. Um, for instance, uh, there's there, husbands and wives they ha- they know each other in a different way than others, and no one else can have this knowledge. It's only for them. Um, So scripture is this kind of knowledge. Only God can tell you who he is. And so we have to listen then to what he says and hear what we're saying is what he's written down. Um, So scripture is the only source and norm of two things, belief and life. What is, what is the, um, why is it the source and norm of what we believe? Because it's what we're supposed to believe. I mean, it's, it's the truth. Yeah, right. So it's, it's it, our faith has a content, right? Sometimes we, we'd say faith a lot, and it doesn't, uh, faith, faith isn't, is, a, is the vessel, right? Um, but what it holds is the important thing. Now, of course, you're, holding, you're the one that holds on with the faith. So you're the one that wants to hold on to it. But if I have faith that uh, my coffee will give me eternal life, will my faith save me? No, right? What faith holds on to is the important element. Right? Now, faith is important to you because it's, that's what connects you to it. But what your faith holds on to is what will save you or not. So then, uh, that, that it forms our belief. It forms what we believe in. So it is the content. If you want to know what you believe in, hold up your Bible, that's it. Right? That's the content of everything we know of God for our salvation. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, uh, the power of God is given to us through His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is that spirit. In order for us to carry it with us, we either have to have a spiritual radio, which wasn't invented, or a spiritual Facebook, which wasn't invented. So what did they have? They had the written word. Actually, they had the spoken word, which came to people, and then they had the written word. And that written word begins not with uh, the Gospels. It begins with the very first words of Genesis. By the hand of Moses, by the inspiration of God. And it's that connection, that, 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 that training that God works through means. It means are men who are inspired by God, inspired. That's right. To, to do this. And, you know, there's no other way. Right. Yeah, so, so we cling to then what God has spoken and written. So it's our belief, but also how we live. So it shows us everything we need to live our lives now. So, the, so scripture then is what we believe in and how we live. Uh, and the reason why it's so important is um, who makes the rules? So then how do I, first of all, then how do I know what they are? Yeah, right? But then um, in order to, uh, to do them, what do I have to... So, so I, I know what they are. I have the, I, I, I read the Bible, but what's next? You have to remember them. 
Yes, you remember them? And then what? Can you do it, right? You know, it, you shall not murder is not just don't kill people, right? But it's care for their bodies. That's, that's, and, and so we know God has told us to care for the bodies of others. Regardless of who they are, regardless of what they've done to us, we are to care for them. So it's not just meant to be information, but it's what we trust in and what we do. So scripture then, uh, th- so the definition of scripture then is God's word written down. All right, so let's dig into point number one here. Um, formerly the word of God was only oral. Later, at the time of Moses, the Lord himself began to write it down. And then he commanded us to pay attention and listen to it. These scriptures, written words, contain all that is needed for faith and life in Christ. Um, so what is the one... So there's different sources of knowledge. We've talked about that. One, one source of knowledge... Uh, is your own experience, right? Um, what are other sources of knowledge? How do you how do you uh, begin to know something? History would be one. Okay, how do you how do you begin to know history? We read about it, actually. Right. Okay, and, and so that implies something else. That we would understand what we're reading. Oh, that's true. Yes. So we need education, right? But also. Who wrote it down? Yeah, people that lived it. What? Yes, people that lived it or witnessed it, right? Or they knew someone who saw it, right? So, and that that can continue ad nauseum. You you know you know, and this is why we have primary sources and secondary sources. Yeah. History. um, We get a lot of that. That's right. That's right. Because the Holy Spirit, well, that's right. That's right. Um, because who was there when God made the world? Okay. So who is the only one who can report on it? God. Right. So if God doesn't tell us, then we won't know. Um, all right. So then we have the sources of knowledge of our own experience. But you named it exactly right. We have the other sources of knowledge is other people telling us about what happened, right? And um, in, in our experience, it's also our reason, right? That's, what's, that's a source of knowledge, right? We take things and we can make stuff. I mean, look at everything around us. We have made tables and chairs. We have manufactured an entire building. Where did that come from? The contractors, yeah. <laughs> but the resources came from the earth, and the design came from from man, right? We made it. With our reason, we were able to do this. And it has stood for over a century. So this is how powerful knowledge is when it is applied. And our sources of reason, and why they have physical realities to them. If I know something, I can make something. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, the reason I'm spending this time on how you know something is because, uh, again, many times our, the doubt is given. Well, you know, uh, this is the, the, the Bible is against science. Well, no, it's just a different way of knowing. Right? It, if I want to know what happened in my great grandmother's um, conversation with my great grandfather. I can know all the science I want. It's never going to tell me what happened. I had a seance. No, not seance, science. Yeah, so unless they wrote it down. Right, so science is useless. Science is useless when it comes to that. So when it comes to history, more important than science is accurate reporting. But again, that's, this is the dichotomy that people bring up. Well, you know, the, the Bible's unscientific. Well, no, it's not. It's, it's a report of what God has said and what God has done. 
Um, so again, th that's why these sources of knowledge are important to separate. Because uh, unless the person is saying, well, I was there and it was different, which they can't because they weren't, um, then, then they, have to, they have to disprove it in some other way. And may that be a warning to your own mind. You know, not to listen to your own thoughts about it. That's not going to do you any good. Right? Someone has to be there and to say a different story. And if there's nothing different, then maybe it's true. Yeah. So I think the point you just made was, if John says the Bible is it's against science, or it's, it's not science, true, it's a report. Right, exactly. Yeah. And again, I, I'm using science broadly, how it's generally used. Um, the word science is just the... the Latin word for knowledge, right? Scantia. And, and so knowledge, that's why I wanted to break apart the word knowledge because it's still knowledge. This is knowledge you can't get in any other way. But you can't use math to figure out what God said. Right? That's, it, you can't do it. Um, okay. So... Now we have a good report. So the scriptures are God's report, written down by men, and they are his very words. And it's the only way you can know him. Right? There's only one path there. Um, okay. Oh, and, and notice too, if, if, God, if then these scriptures are claiming for themselves a report that God said, these are the only ones you can read, then it's very important that if someone comes from the outside and says, no, 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 this, you should read this too, they have to prove why in the scriptures it's a bad report. Right? That, it's up to them to prove that. You have to tell me why this guy who wrote in 500 BC and only, is only one person, and he was out in the desert, and he was drinking a little too much, and he wrote this stuff down in a cave somewhere, um, that why is that more accurate than what I have? Um, okay, so uh, I'm at point B now. Where do we find the word of the apostles in their written word? Right? If, it re if it remained only a report in our ears, then we may have reason to doubt. Right? But here, it's written down. How do we know? Well, the apostles said they wrote it down. <laughs> Right? And, and, and again, this isn't a bad source of knowledge. It's the best source of knowledge. If I want to know why someone did something, what should I do? Ask them the question. They're the best source for that knowledge. Right? Uh, so here, the apostles actually say, uh, in 1 John 1, John says, the things we have seen and the things we have experienced and the things we have touched and done, we have written down for you. Right? And you probably know uh, even better uh, the one in John 21. I, I didn't put it down here. You can write it down if you want. But in John, uh, oh, I'm sorry, John 20, um, where he says, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He actually he tells you everything. I wrote it down so that it will give you faith about who Jesus is because it's the only way you can get it. Um, okay. So uh, in 1 John, though, he, he uh, attests to that. And also in 2 Thessalonians uh, 2.15, this is when uh, the apostle says, we, the things we have spoken and written are good enough for you to reject the other teaching. Um, so the apostles say they wrote it down, and the apostles insist on belief in their word. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, if you do not hold to the words we have written here, you are not recognized by God. So Paul himself is saying these things. Uh, and, and so, again, we're getting the knowledge from a first-hand report, which is the best one to get. Um, all right, we're at point, uh, point C here. When the Scripture principle, as the only norm for faith and life, is rejected... Human ego is inserted as the teacher. Now this list of six things is nothing more than when we insert something as the judge instead of what God has said. Uh, so again, remember, where does the knowledge of God come from? God! But how did he, how did he give it to us? 
through writing, through telling men what he wanted to say, and they wrote it down. Right? They're, they're, it's like if, I, if I'm sitting here and you tell me, okay, tell me your report, Tony, and I'm writing down each word you say. Um, so that then is the judge. But, but when you don't have the scriptures as the main judge, you're going to insert something. So here's a list of things that people insert. Number one, natural reason. Now, of course, we've heard that time and again, right? Um, it's unscientific. Um, you know, think of all the cultural issues that they had back then. And the list goes on and on. Um, but natural reason is when I think my logic is smarter than the scriptures. Right? Um, but again, this is, it is a source of knowledge. We don't deny that reason is a great source of knowledge. Look at what we've built. Look at, look at what we're doing every day. But it's, it cannot be the source of the inner mind of God. My reason cannot create that knowledge. He has to tell me. And if I try to use my reason to get to that, or where is, where is the knowledge going to come from? If I try to use my human reason to think what God thinks, who is, wh- what am I going to end up with? My thoughts, right? So, so then who is God? Me, right? That's how that works. And that's why human reason becomes a substitute for God. And then I become God. I decide. Right? I judge the scriptures. Yeah. When God gives you this reason, everybody has it. When I come up with my reasons, my intros, if I were on a desert island, I might think that I'm God because I'm all by myself, except for Wilson and Paul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Wilson. That's but right. When I'm in a room like this or any other place with other people, guess what? My word doesn't have, it doesn't mean anything. It's the same currency as everybody else. Right. But then you get theoretical Gnosticism. Right. Right. Well, but this is the great thing about truth is truth is objective. Truth is by its nature outside of you. Uh, and, and so we can either conform to the truth in our thoughts and in our, in our actions and therefore uh, live a blessed life from God or we can rebel against the truth. And, and um, here's, a, here's an example of rebelling against the truth. Uh, I think that my car can pass through walls. What may I do if I am rebelling against the truth of a wall? You may encounter one, and you will not just pass through. Your car will be crushed, uh, and the building will be crushed, and other things will happen. So, so again, that's, this is the objective nature of, of truth. Okay? Um, okay, so natural reason can judge. Oh, here's a good one. Number two, Christian experience. This is one of the most deceptive things in our time. Is, well, I felt. I think, I feel God talking to me. If, if God does not, God verbally speaks. If he has not verbally spoken to you, do not listen. Also, if you hear something speaking to you, you need to check it with the scriptures. Because you know who else can speak? Satan and all his demons. And he most certainly will use it. So Christian experience is not a substitute for the scriptures or for true knowledge of God. Now, the the comforting thing about this is, what does this mean for your faith? It's not dependent on that. Your faith is not dependent on your experiences. It's not dependent on how comfortable or how tense you feel. It's not dependent on how depressed you are. It's not dependent on how many mental illnesses you have. What is your faith dependent on? The objective word, which is Christ himself. And the fact that you have faith is not based on your experience either. He gave it to you. It's something you have, and therefore it can't be taken. Okay, so Christian experience, bad judge. Um, oh, here's one, number three. Some people say, well, you have to, you have to base... Um, the, you have to base the truths that we, that we take from Scripture from the whole of Scripture and not from exact passages. 
Okay, let me, let me tell you how that works. Um, okay, does Scripture uh, define what marriage is? Okay, but doesn't somewhere in there say you shouldn't judge? Okay, so, so now, but see, but you, you got to use the whole of Scripture. Jesus said don't judge, and therefore we can't judge people who may not adhere to this particular norm of marriage, right? So you have to use the whole of Scripture. So you see, they're, they're taking it, mashing it all together, and then using it however they want, as opposed to taking exact pieces of teaching from where they are taught. When Jesus said, don't judge, he meant you as a human being cannot be condemning people to hell. It's not your job. You can tell them of their sin. Because how do I know that? That's the way Jesus said it in the context. So exact doctrines, exact teachings are taken from the exact verses that say that teaching. And not just because all, all of Scripture may or may not say something. So if I say something to you, and I say it's from God's Word, what do I have to prove to you? Where is the verse? Show me the verse that says that. You cannot say, I just, you know, well, I just, I combined a bunch of them. It's all of Scripture. No. I have to show you where in Scripture it is. If I want to show you that baptism saves, I have to show you 1 Peter. I have to show you Mark 16. Those exact verses tell us what we believe. Okay, so again, that's usually when people want to use Scripture and some vague knowledge they have to try to say you're wrong. Um, and now we too should be careful and not fall into this. It's easy to do to remember at some point some dude said something on TV about what God said. Okay? If you don't have scripture in your brain, don't use that. Right? Or go back to the scriptures and read it. Um, all right. Uh, Let's see, number four. Uh, let me finish this up, Gary, and then I'll get to you. Um, oh, number four. The church or its decrees are the judge. No matter how many resolutions we pass here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church, they do not make God's word more or less true. We could do whatever we want here, but God's word remains true whether or not we agree with it. Now, this is not the case for which church body? The Roman Catholic Church. The decisions of the church are the continued revelation of God. They do not believe in a closed scripture. That, yeah. That could also apply to I'll call it the non the non Catholic churches and their deliberate bodies because they vote. Yes. Um, yes, you're right. Yes. So uh, so the non Catholic churches are still making these kind of decisions. The United Methodist Church makes these kind of decisions about the scriptures and they judge them. And they say, well, by our decree, we as this group of churches say that God's word can be thrown out. Or we can change it for however we want. Yes? It's interesting that we're okay with judging God's word, but not with judging each other. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it hurts less to judge, you know, a book. <laughs> um, okay, number five. Oh, yes. Would you consider churches that misuse misinterpret God's word and the doctrines that are not, not really biblical mm -hmm. also setting themselves as, as churches of God's word. That's right. Yep. Anytime you take something out of your own mind and mix it with scripture uh, and then say, well, now what you have come up with is the truth, that's substituting your decree for the scriptures. All right, number five, private revelations. And this goes a little bit with Christian experience, but this is more specific, right? I had a vision. Um, I, uh, I, I had some, uh, some direct verbal thing talk to me, okay? A private revelation does not judge the scriptures. It has to be in line with the scriptures. Pentecostal. Well, right, yeah. So the, the Pentecostal church many times uh, falls into this. 
But again, many, many people, and, and we do this as well, fall into, well, you know, um, some bird flew through the sky as I was contemplating whether or not it was going to go on a trip. And therefore, God is giving me a private revelation about, you know. And again, I've done it too, right? You probably have found uh, yourself in a certain situation and, and you thought, oh man, God must have been doing that. Well, maybe. Now, in one sense it's true. God works all things, all the time. But if you're trying to derive a very specific thing out of that, it's one thing for me to say, oh, look, I know that God is leading me to where I need to go, um, and I trust him to do it. Okay? And, then you, you, and then you conform all situations that happen to you because of that truth in Scripture. That's one way of having good Christian experience and going through suffering and knowing that there's a purpose, right? It doesn't mean we can't say that. However, um, we can't base specific decisions on something outside of God's word as his teaching. So what would that look like? Um, Well, God told me I have to marry this particular person because on Tuesday uh, there was a name, Ted, and then on Wednesday I saw a name, uh, Wendelson, and so I have to marry Ted Wendelson. That that is not a teaching of Scripture. It's a private revelation, and you can't depend on it. Yeah? Does the Bible say somewhere that feel like you've gotten a revelation from God, it's private, and you shouldn't share it. Yeah, well, and, well actually, uh, you're right. Or, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. This is in 1 Corinthians. Th- this was happening all the time. People were coming with their own revelations and their own teachings, and they brought them to church, and, and Paul said, the, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets, meaning the Old Testament and the apostles. So there's not going to be a new revelation. It's going to be different than what God has already said. Remember, everything for faith and life is in the scriptures. Okay, finally, number six, history is judge. Okay, uh, maybe you've heard the phrase, uh, oh, the Bible is historically backwards, right? Or you're historically backwards, right? You believe that, uh, that women and men have certain roles, and you believe that God created everything? Don't you know that we're in a progressive age? Well, again, that's using history as the judge. Uh, as some, somehow we've progressed to a point, and those people back then are just foolish cavemen, and we know what we're talking about. Uh, if, if there was any man who was the smartest man in history, it was Adam, right? because he was the only one who ever lived without sin. Now, of course, he fell into sin, so maybe after that he became sort of stupid. Uh, but, uh, but before that point, his reasoning was perfect, both without sin and in its ordering. Uh, so we do not look that direction. Right? We, we look forward to Christ's coming, and we know what we came from. Uh, so history is not the judge. Scripture tells us how to judge. All right. Uh, Gary, did you still have your point? Well, I don't know if it's totally germane, but what you're saying sort of deals with it in the sense that when we read Scripture and try to figure out what it's saying, uh, which we do and probably should be, let the Holy Spirit speak to us, but everything is contextual in, in the world. The problem is, is that in the Bible, we have to relate it to God's will. And if we don't have faith in God, it's going to be hard for us to even believe Scripture because we won't understand the context. But notice Something is said about something, there's a context. So that doesn't fit the Bible. If you look somewhere else where it's said, context is different, and it becomes a principle. So we have to know the whole scene of this and be careful getting into some kind of a contextualization that leads us astray in the human thought. Right, yeah. So, so again, when, when we use our surroundings to, to interpret Scripture, this is called... I said Jesus, that's what uh, Pastor Basie was talking about last week. We're bringing something to the text and then understanding the text with our own reason. Okay, Scripture was written in a language. Two languages. Well, three, technically. Uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And they're understandable. You can read it. And of course it's been translated. So you can go and read it yourself. 
And you can check and say, well, that's not what it says. God is the best communicator right? par excellence. He knows how to speak. And he is not limited by our culture or by our time and history. Um, okay, so uh, let's go on to, to the second major point here. So now we know Scripture is the only source for this kind of knowledge. Next, we need to understand Scripture, Holy Scripture, that is the writings, are identical with the Word of God. That's, that's the next premise here. Okay, so then how do, we, how do we find out if every word in there is truly from God? How do we find that out? If I want to know if every word in the scriptures is really from God, how do I find that out? Well, we just, yes! Yeah! God reported it. He told us if it was actually there. And as a matter of fact, scripture uses itself all the time so that Jesus himself is quoting the Old Testament, and he himself says it can't be broken. So he quotes out of the Old Testament, he calls it God's word, so that God himself has affirmed what has been spoken in the past. Because again, it's not a matter of science. Right? It's not, and I mean that in the general way. It's not a matter of me proving a math problem or chemistry. Those are valuable, and they create their own kinds of knowledge. They just don't happen to be this kind of knowledge. Again, if I want to know about somebody, what do I have to do? I have to ask them, right? Or talk to someone who knows them. So here we have both. The direct speaking of God and also those who have seen and heard him and written it down. Um, so the identification of Scripture with God's word is found within the Scriptures themselves. So God has reported, these are where I am speaking, and this is where you will find my word. Um, so the Old Testament is quoted, so I'm in number one, underneath, point, uh, underneath Roman numeral two there. The Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament plainly as God's word. Um, so Matthew 1, you have Isaiah 7, uh, and uh, this is where uh, Jesus is born. They, they will call him Emmanuel. Right? This is the prophecy in the Old Testament. Uh, and it says, these things are written. Now, the book of Matthew itself is actually one of the greatest proofs of this. Because almost every point along the way, Matthew is at pains to show that this is what the prophets said. So, in Matthew, you'll read more than any other of the Gospels. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. Right? Why is, he so, why is Matthew so eager to show that it was written. Well, th this is true. His audience was the Jews. Yep, and that's that was a historical reality. But why? Why? Why is it so important to say it was written by this person? Yeah. He was basically practicing what Scripture interprets Scripture. Right. In other words, because everything in the Old Testament follows on. You know, it is written in the law of the prophets. And right. if you read that, it's hard to read the Old Testament being long and buried. But when you read it, you find out it all has the same message. Christ right. is coming. Yep. And, and then... You know, right. And Christ himself summarizes this in the last chapter of Mark. He says everything that was in Moses and the Psalms, he includes the Psalms there, and the prophets. And we know who those were. We know the books of Moses. We know the Psalms. We know the prophets. So that those things are trustworthy and true. Jesus himself has said so. But of course, in the Old Testament, uh, we have God speaking. Direct report from God himself. Okay, so uh, the Old Testament is quoted uh, in the New Testament plainly as God's word. So again, Jesus is telling us, the apostles are telling us, that this is what God said. Um, and number two, 
The New Testament writings are considered God's word by scripture. Okay, so notice again, you have the New Testament affirming the old. So the report from God has not changed. But now you have the old, or sorry, the New Testament also saying that what's written now in the New Testament is scripture. Um, so in 1 Peter, uh, he relates the two. He says the things that were written and the things that are written now are scripture. Uh, so, so you have the affirmation that we can know what God said because it was written down. Um, okay, uh, I'm at uh, two point B. What the apostles saw and heard, they wrote down. That was First John. We already discussed that one. And then Part C. We, we've we've discussed this one too. But uh, both the preaching and the letter are God's word. That's in Second Thessalonians two. Uh, point D. There, there is more of these. So again, I'm just picking and choosing these. They're all over the place. Um, and someone quoted the uh, no, First Timothy. Uh, all things are written. All scripture is breathed out by the word by God, um, and and that also is a great verse here. Uh, so number three here uh, is is vital for us to get the final concept here. Luther unites the written scriptures and God's word. There is no difference between the two. So. One thing to, to remember in this is if you want to know what God says about something, how do you find out? <laughs> Read it or hear it. Read it or hear it, right? Again, the, the, if, if only we could tell our sinful flesh this all the time, you know, gosh, you know, what would God say about that? <laughs> there should be like a blinking arrow in your head. Ding, ding, ding. Read the Bible. <laughs> Again, we, we, we have a fear of this because for, I think over time now, Satan's tactic, tactic has been, oh, well, you know, that'd be like reading a science textbook. Wrong. What, does, what kind of writing is in the Bible? What, like if you were to call it a certain kind of literature, what kind of literature is it? Yeah, what, yeah okay, what, what's an epistle? What is it? A letter. What are, what are letters written for? For the person they're sent to. Did Paul send letters to the university? Who did he send them to? Who? Okay, so what is the church? The people. They were there for you. And this is what the this is what Isaiah wrote down. This is what Moses wrote down, so that you would be able. To see with your own eyes and hear with your own ears God's word to you. And the amazing thing about the scriptures is they're not written in crazy technical language. They're written for us. And God himself promises that he will reveal them to you. He is a teacher. So don't be afraid to read the Bible. Um, okay, so that's where God's word is. Uh, I'm still in number three here. We should not despise Scripture for its humble expression, which is for our sake. The Scriptures are set apart from all other words and writings as God's own word. So if, if you could do something that would... Um, well, okay, here's a better question. Uh, if you have a super expensive piece of jewelry, what do you do with it when you're not wearing it? Just lock it up. Why? Yeah, and, and why? No one steals it, right? And so, why else? Yeah, you, yeah, you protect it so it doesn't, you know, fall somewhere, right? You don't lose it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's precious. And it's precious, right? It's precious. Now we do this with words too. Um, what are some of the things you you remember the most? Some of the words you remember the most. Who were they spoken by? Grandfather. Grandfather? That's a great one. My wife. <laughs> you say your wife. <laughs> True wisdom there. <laughs> now, now, why is it... That's stupid. <laughs> why is it that those words are in your memory? The people we value. 
Ah, you put them there. You did it on purpose because you loved the person. Right? Now, you hear things all the time. Do you remember everything? Oh, no. No, right? You're not going to remember three-fourths of this class. <laughs> but when you love someone, their words do stick with you. Now, here, uh, how much should we love God? <laughs> okay, so then how much should his word stay in our minds? All the time, right? We should, we should be there. Now, what, now, now, I'm sure you're feeling guilty now. Good. Um, why doesn't it? Okay, expand on that, Judy. What, what does it mean to be human? Yeah, and, and why would we, why would that cause us? Yes, yes. Selfish sinners, right? This shows us what, what our sinful hearts do all the time. We focus on ourselves and we focus on, on our own th- things, right? Uh, things outside of God so that we betray ourselves constantly. How much of Scripture have we memorized? And it leaves us. Right? So this means that not that we should um, continue in your feeling guilty. Confess your sin when you know that you haven't valued God's word. Christ forgives you. But then what we should do is continue to learn it and read it and mark it and know that our weakness is it's going to be really hard to put it up there. So if I know that I have a really hard time remembering something, how do I remember it better? Do it more, right? <laughs> and, and make it part of your habits and part of your, your life. And you're doing it now. Right? You're, you're coming to church. And, and you'd be amazed at the things you will remember. Um, this is one of the reasons for our liturgy. Uh, that, that ingrained itself so deeply in your mind that I can go to someone who is in deep stages of dementia and I can start the Lord's Prayer and guess what? Now these are people that may, they probably didn't even talk to me. And I can start saying those things and boom, they start saying it. Right? So it's, it's so deep in us when we, when we make these ruts in our minds and in our hearts, they stick to us. Uh, and it's why it's good for us to keep on rolling it around and, and keeping it in our minds because God promises to be with it. His word is different than ours. So that Bible, maybe, maybe a, better, a better idea, take all your jewelry and throw it in your living room and then take your Bible and put it in your jewelry case. <laughs> right? Because which one's more precious? <laughs> you're right, you're right. The best place to keep it, because that's not really where you keep it, right? The best place to keep it is here and here. Right? Uh, and the only way to do that is to listen and to be in Christian fellowship. This is why fellowship is so joyous among Christians. Um, but this is the best part about this. Is it's the, Again, it's, this isn't just a bullet point. It's the truth. You actually have God's word right there, and it's all that you need for everything you believe and all of your life. You never have to wonder about what you should do. You never have to wonder about what you should believe, right? God doesn't want you to. He wants you to know. He wants you to be clear about it. And that's, that's, this is the best part about it. God wants you to have confidence in him. Not to depend on yourself. You don't have to depend on yourself. Um, okay. Well, let's see. I might be able to get to this. Yeah, this one's um, uh, yeah, this one's a more boring point. So we'll get to this one uh, just shortly, and then I'll I'll move on. Now, maybe it won't be boring to you, and we'll get to it next week. But uh, I'll hit it, and then we'll we'll stop. Um, okay. So the scriptures are the word of God because they are inspired. Okay, so they're unique words because they are given by the Holy Spirit. Each one of them. Um, so here, here's the points under this. So I'm at uh, 
Part 3, Point A. Inspiration is not just the inspiration of a person. Okay, so, uh, so again, it's not that Paul walked around glowing all the time. I know Moses actually glowed with his face, but again, um, the point here is the Holy Spirit inspired them to write something, not just to be someone. Um, also, inspiration is not just uh, the subject in general. Now, that would be something like this. Um, Paul had a general idea that he needed to write to the Corinthians about spiritual gifts, but the rest was up to him. No, that's not what. That's not inspiration. Okay. Now, again, whole church bodies hold to that, but that's not inspired. That's not what we believe. That's not what Scripture says. It's every word. Right? Um, okay. So, uh, but what we believe and what Scripture confesses is the words themselves, each word, are inspired, given by the Holy Spirit. And this is the Second Timothy three. I'm sorry, it was Second Timothy, not First Timothy. Um, that says every word was inspired by or breathed out by God, right? Uh, inspired by God, given by the Holy Spirit. So it's not the person, not the subject, it's the words themselves. Those are the inspiration. All right, uh, point B there. It is not only guidance and protection from error. Okay, so it wasn't like the Holy Spirit just, uh, again, gave them a general idea and then made sure that they didn't screw it up. Okay? It's not the thoughts of Paul you're getting. And it's not the thoughts of Isaiah. These are God's thoughts and his words. It's a divine giving of the exact words. Okay, <clears throat> point C. Now this is the best part. Inspiration does not cover only a part of Scripture, but all of it, every single word in there, is from God. So there's no accidents. There's no word that God's, God, um, again, we, we speak too much sometimes, right? We, and, and you probably all know someone who speaks too much sometimes. Uh, but God doesn't speak too much. He gives you exactly the words you need. And they are the exact words he means to say. Oh, he also doesn't give accidental words. He doesn't misspeak. He didn't mean to say something else. Again, I know you probably don't think that about Scripture, but it's so common for us to think about when people, oh, man, I said that wrong. I should have said it this way. God doesn't do that. It's every word on purpose with the exact meaning. He chose that meaning for that word. Um, point D, inspiration. That is, the Holy Spirit giving all Scripture and each of its words means Scripture is inerrant, without error, in each and all of its words. This is faith. This is what we believe, and it's what God tells us of His own word. And finally, Inspiration includes the command and impulse to write the scriptures. Uh, now, I put that down because, uh, again, it, it, it's not just that the, the, the people were given the word of God and then they just spoke it all the time, or that somehow inspiration is still happening and people are just saying it in oral tradition. But they were, they were given the command by God to put it into writing. So it wasn't an accident, but they wrote it for our sake. Um, so that's what inspiration. So when we say inspiration, we mean the Holy Spirit giving the exact words and all of their exact meanings in those scriptures. Um, okay, so any, any questions before we, we end? I'll, I'll end there. We'll finish up with those uh, two points next time. And then we'll get to the, the next part. But any other questions? Yes, sir. Question, but to look forward maybe in next week. Is there any opportunity to talk about all the different translations? And, like, is the Word of God inspired only by the oh. apostles? And somehow man might have messed it up when they went into these translations. Yeah, well, okay. We are going to get to some of that, but I, I'll answer that exact question too. Let me, I'll look into that um, and, and bring that up as a topic for next time. So the, the question is, um, what about all the translations? Because, I mean, anyone can take the NIV and the KJV and start reading them next to each other and say, this is different, <laughs> right? Thou knowest, and y'all, 
right? Um, so, uh, so, so we, uh, we, we should discuss that, Earl. Thank you for that point. I'll, I'll put that down, and we'll note it for next time. Yes? What, what about, we talk about letters and exact language. What about parts of scriptures that is wisdom written, such as Job? We don't know who wrote it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's good. All right. And it's, it's not written to a person. It's written for a reason. It's a, it's a, it's a poem. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll get to that, too. Right. I mean, it's not wisdom to a specific person. Right. Yeah. What do we do with those, those ones? Yeah. Good. Okay. I will... Uh, so, if you, if you heard that... Um, uh, what about wisdom literature, which isn't written to somebody? Um, and also, when we don't know the author, how do, we, how do we deal with that when it comes to inspiration? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that down. We'll, we'll answer that one. Yeah, Gary. Yeah. Last part. Uh, even Luther comments on, on Hebrews. It doesn't seem to be attributed. And there is, you know, in the historical critical and all this critical thinking thing, they tend to want to take Hebrews into the because you don't really know who wrote it or what it looks like Paul. But the point is, Hitler said that it, because Luther said, sorry, but anyway, as Luther was saying in, in his commentaries, he said, is that the thing about Hebrews is, is that it's totally consistent with the rest of the Bible. And therefore, he felt that it was an inspired word of God by either a scribe or somebody familiar with these things. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's an unnamed prophet in a sense, but that's also, I think, part of what you're talking about, inspiration of contributed sources. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, good. So thank you for the questions, and we'll, we'll address those. Those are great questions. Anyone else with questions or comments? All right. Well, thanks for coming today. We'll. Uh, we'll oh, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yeah. The, he he said. Well, James is an epistle of straw, yeah. right? And, and thought about throwing out. Well, we'll we'll deal with that too. Um, we'll we'll discuss the canon. That is um, the sort of what. Why do we have the books we have? That. Yeah. We'll we'll discuss that too. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, see, this is a problem. We're, we're going to get derailed, and then we're just going to be on this for the next year. All right. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word, promising that it is your word, and continuing to enlighten our hearts and minds. Help us to always look to you and know that we know exactly what you say for our sake. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have to return my book. I, I didn't oh, have my how phone. Dare you. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Had to go old school. <laughs> old school, yeah. The paper. You know, yeah. so this is a problem with the electronic medium. You know, now, uh, I think ESV has said they're just going to keep changing their translation as time goes on. Really? Or just, I mean, just in general, it's... because language changes, so they're going to, you know. Which, I mean, there's some credit to them. You know, it, it, so, it should be how, what we understand, but... Yeah. This is a tangent, but you're from you know, Kansas City, right? Uh, Missouri. Missouri. Okay, Okay. so this question comes from a friend of mine who's from Missouri. Or, or the context of it. So if there's y'all, what is all y'all? <laughs> <laughs> That's the, um, the, uh, the double positive. You know, it's... it's it's an emphasis. It's not, it's not just like, y'all, like but it's all. Cer- all this is most certainly true. <laughs> this is <laughs> so listening to a program uh, concerning uh, this guy, Timothy Bible Hour. I don't know if you've ever seen him. Uh, he does, I think I've heard of him. He did uh, only three, three visits. It took him something like almost an hour and a half or more. Because he like scooped down on it. Yeah, so I saw this guy. Yeah. 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 So, but he also has been uh, doing work at us. I think in somewhere in Utah, I believe, or Denver, maybe, the cathedral, one of those towns, sings. Um, he asked him about, about scripture. And the guy said, you really don't do much in scripture because.